Family, a prayer that we pray together is a powerful prayer. So please pray together with me our EWTN family prayer. Today we pray for peace in the world. Lord Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, we need you. The world is filled with strife and violence, and this fills us with fear. You told your disciples that peace was your gift to them. Give us your peace to bring us calm in the midst of the storm. Instill your gift of peace into the hearts of all men, that they may seek reconciliation and understanding. Quiet the sounds of war and hatred, and raise up a chorus of harmony and peace. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. As we venerate the glorious memory of the Most Holy Virgin Mary, grant, we pray, O Lord, through her intercession, that we too may merit to receive from the fullness of your grace. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the second book of Samuel. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he came to him, Nathan said, Just this case for me. In a certain town, there were two men, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had flocks and herds in great numbers, but the poor man had nothing at all except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He nourished her, and she grew up with him and his children. She shared the little food he had and drank from his cup and slept in his bosom. She was like a daughter to him. Now the rich man received a visitor, but he would not take from his own flocks and herds to prepare a meal for the wayfarer who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and made a meal of it for his visitor. David grew very angry with that man and said to him, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this merits death. He shall restore the ewe lamb fourfold because he has done this and has had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, the, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will bring evil upon you out of your own house. I will take your wives while you live to see it and will give them to your neighbor. He shall lie with your wives in broad daylight. You have done this deed in secret, but I will bring it about in the presence of all Israel and with the sun looking down. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan answered David, the Lord on his part has forgiven your sin. You shall not die. But since you have utterly spurned the Lord by this deed, the child born to you must surely die. Then Nathan returned to his house. The Lord struck the child that the wife of Uriah had born to David, and it became desperately ill. David besought God for the child. He kept the fast, retiring for the night to lie on the ground clothed in sackcloth. The elders of his house stood beside him, urging him to rise from the ground, but he would not, nor would he take food with them. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> Create a clean heart in me, O God. A clean heart create for me, O God and a steadfast spirit renew within me. Cast me not out from your presence, and your Holy Spirit take not from me. Give me back the joy of your salvation, and a willing spirit sustain in me. I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall return to you. Free me from blood guilt, O God, my saving God. Then my tongue shall revel in your justice. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise.
Dominus Fobiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum. On that day, as evening drew on, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us cross to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took Jesus with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. A violent squall came up, and waves were breaking over the boat, so that it was already filling up. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Quiet, be still. The wind ceased, and there was great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you terrified? Do you not yet have faith? They were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this whom even the wind and sea obey? Verbum Domini. In our reading today from the second book of Samuel, God sent the prophet Nathan to confront David regarding his grave sins and ultimately to lead him to repentance. Nathan told David a parable and he presented it as a court case, saying, judge this case for me. After hearing the case, David's heart was stirred to great anger at the injustice that had been recounted. And he said, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this merits death. He had no idea that his condemnation of the guilty man in the court case was a condemnation against himself and what he had done. You are the man, Nathan said to him. And this is where David is an example for us because he didn't try to excuse himself. Remember earlier on in the book of Samuel, Saul was confronted by his sins when he disobeyed the Lord with regard to the battle they went into. And when Saul was confronted, King Saul, he tried to excuse himself or blame other people. David here is confronted with regard to his grave sins, and he immediately repents. He's an example to us of repentance, of conversion. Again, he did not seek to excuse himself. His first words were, I have sinned against the Lord. Again, remember, David was the king, and he had a lot of power. There could have been a temptation there for him to say, who are you to accuse me? I am the king. Who are you to confront the king? How dare you accuse me? Again, he didn't try to hide his sin when he was confronted with it. But when he became aware of its gravity, he immediately admitted his sins. He took responsibility and repented. And this required great humility. And Nathan responded, the Lord on his part has forgiven your sin. You shall not die. So we're reminded that no matter how grave a sin we have committed, God truly forgives a contrite and humble heart if we truly repent and turn back to him. However, we know that there are also consequences due to our sins. And so this passage is an occasion to recall the distinction between guilt and temporal punishment due to sin. Right? The guilt of his grave sins of adultery and arranging for the death of an innocent man Bathsheba's husband, remember he arranged that he be killed on the battlefront. Those sins were forgiven when he repented and turned back to the Lord. But as Nathan, as God speaks through the prophet Nathan, there's still going to be temporal punishment due to his sin. There needs to be expiation made. God required a debt of temporal punishment due to David's grave sins. 
And this would entail great personal suffering. There would be violence and rebellion within David's own house and his family. And Nathan tells him his wives would be taken from him, and he would also suffer the loss of the son born of his adulterous union. So David learned through all this that, that suffering is a painful consequence of spurning the Lord and his commandments, turning away from him. And yet again, David is an example because he bore those sufferings patiently in expiation for his sins. He knew that these, sin, these sufferings were purifying him. So again, we see David as a model of heartfelt repentance, of contrition, and humble confession of our sins. And his repentance found particular expression in Psalm 51, which was our responsorial psalm today. We heard a portion of it. The psalm composed by David is often referred to as the miserere, or in Latin it means have mercy. We're asking God for mercy. And it emphasizes humble contrition while asking for God's mercy. And we see elements in this psalm of what's required to be reconciled with God. The psalmist confesses his sin to the Lord. He accepts responsibility for his sin. Again, he doesn't try to excuse himself or blame others. But he also expresses contrition while asking for forgiveness. And he also asks for healing. And there's a powerful petition in Psalm 51 as well for renewal and conversion. As the psalmist prays in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. So when we repent, we not only seek forgiveness, that God might have mercy on us, but we also want to be renewed interiorly. Right? We want to begin brand new. We want to get back on the right track, on the path toward heaven and holiness. So to get back again, to start afresh. And so this Psalm 51 is a prayer that can be incorporated into our own prayer life. It is already incorporated into the official prayer of the church, the Liturgy of the Hours. But it's also a prayer we can incorporate into our own personal prayer lives. And not only, again, seeking God's mercy and his forgiveness, but also praying for that interior renewal by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in our gospel today, we hear the account of the Lord calming the storm on the sea. And that storm had been a threat to sinking the boat in which the apostles and the Lord were on. And one point we can draw from this is that we shouldn't think that we're abandoned by the Lord when we experience temptations or grave trials or sufferings in this life. The apostles thought they were going to die when this violent storm was coming up against and battering their boat. But the Lord was still with them asleep in the boat. He was shielding them. And our Lord didn't chastise them for waking him from sleep. He didn't say, why did you wake me? He chastised them. He corrected them because of the little faith. They didn't have confidence in him and in his power. They said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing when they woke him up? And so in light of this gospel passage, we're reminded to go to Christ as soon as possible in every danger as the apostles did. But one thing we don't want to imitate from the apostles, again, is their lack of confidence in him. Lack of confidence in his divine power and his providence. Because we know the Lord permits sufferings in our lives. He permits trials for our greater good. At times he may seem to be asleep, but we know he's present. God permitted the storm to rise up and to beat against the boat that we might ultimately see his almighty power because when they did wake him, he very simply brought, brought this violent storm to a calm when he said simply, quiet, be still. And this boat that they were in has also traditionally been seen as a type or image of the church. As it was exposed to the violent fury of the storm and the waves, likewise the church is exposed to violent attack of the devil and will continue to be so until our Lord comes again on the last day. We can expect great suffering. And the boat seemed to the apostles in the midst of the storm like it was going to sink, right? Like it was going to be destroyed and that they would perish. And similar that there have been times throughout the history of the church when it seemed like the church was on the brink or point of destruction. But in the gospel, Jesus was asleep on the boat. It would not be destroyed while he himself was on it, right? And he gave us a divine promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. He is guiding the church. 
And at the very precise time appointed by the Lord in his providence, he awoke and he rebuked the storm and he calmed the sea. Again, likewise, our Lord who is all powerful, he is protecting the church. And the church has been attacked and will continue to be attacked, but she will continue on the journey across the storms of the sea of this life until she reaches the harbor of heaven. And regarding the persecution and attacks on the church throughout her history, St. Augustine would say that God willed that it be so. Right? It would make, ultimately, it would make it more clear that the church is of divine institution, not human institution. If it was of human institution, the church would have been destroyed a long time ago. And the storms of persecution and sufferings endured throughout the history of the church also shows that the church imitates her founder, Christ. Remember on the road to Emmaus after the Lord's resurrection when he confronted those disciples as he was leading them, guiding them, instructing them? He said, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and so enter into glory? The church likewise endures suffering. And the boat in today's gospel has also been seen and interpreted as an image of the faithful soul. Right? We're also exposed to storms throughout this life. We have been and we will continue to be exposed to temptations and to suffering in this life. We can't escape suffering. We cannot escape the cross. Or we can't escape being subject to temptations in life. But our Lord has permitted these storms in our life for our spiritual good. And he does offer the grace to persevere through them. And he does give us consolation at times, just as he calmed the sea in the gospel today. He does give us times of peace and consolation. And when we look at the lives of the saints, we see that they persevered through many storms in their life, but they are also blessed at times with great peace and consolation. So with this gospel passage in mind, we know that we will never experience perfect peace and calm in this life. There will be moments of it. But if we're in a moment of consolation now, we know this is not going to last in this life. It's only in heaven that there will be perfect and unending peace and joy and happiness that God wants us to experience. We're also reminded to be prepared for storms that will come up unexpectedly in life. And we want to turn to the Lord again as soon as possible in those times of distress to beg him for his grace and his help. So we pray today through the intercession of Our Lady that we may never lose faith and confidence in Christ and in his divine providence knowing that he is all-powerful and that he loves us with an everlasting and unending love. The Father gave his Son to Mary so that the world would receive him through her. Therefore, we ask that she intercede for us now as we offer the following petitions. That the church may rejoice in the boundless mercy of God, which has achieved our salvation and celebrate the glory that has been bestowed upon us in Christ. We pray to the Lord. Lord that the lay faithful may have the courage and generosity to take on increasing responsibility for the church's works of education and evangelization, we pray to the Lord. Lord. That we may not be afraid to be faithful to Jesus, teaching on the dignity of human life, even, even if our faithfulness causes some to separate from us, we pray to the Lord. Lord. For an increase in vocations to the priesthood and the consecrated life, we pray to the Lord that those who have died may rest in peace. We pray to the Lord. Loving Father, you bless us in every way, especially with the love of the mother of your son. United to Mary, we magnify your name, we rejoice in your mercy, and we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. We ask that you continually increase our trust our love, and our joy. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen.
pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands. For the grace and glory of his name. For our good and good of all his holy church. We offer you the sacrifice of praise, O Lord, as we rejoice in commemorating the mother of your Son. Grant, we pray, that through this most holy exchange, we may advance towards eternal redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dominus vobiscum. Et cum Sum corda. Gracias agamus, Domino Deo Nostro. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, to praise your mighty deeds in the exaltation of all the saints and especially as we celebrate the memory of the Blessed Virgin Mary, to proclaim your kindness as we echo her thankful hymn of praise. For truly, even to earth's ends, you have done great things and extended your abundant mercy from age to age. When you looked on the lowliness of your handmaid, you gave us through her the author of our salvation, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him the host of angels adores your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. May our voices, we pray, join with theirs in one chorus of exultant praise as we acclaim. <laughs> To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you, firstly, for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, and Stephen, our Bishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. And all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, for they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls and hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. 
in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John, and Paul, Cosmos and Damien, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers in all things, we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more, giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mysterium Fidei. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the Blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them. As once you are pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, that all who sleep in Christ a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who through sinners, who thou sinners hope in your abundant mercies, gloriously wait, grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, 
with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Salinus, Peter, Felicity, Petua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them and bestow them upon us. Per ipsum et cum ipso et in ipso, est tibi Deo Patri Omnipotenti, in unitate Spiritus Sancti, omnis honor et gloria, per omnia secula seculorum. Recepti salutaribus moniti, et divina institutione formati, audemus dicere. Pater noster, vi es in celis, sanctifices nomen tu, Quesumus Domine ab omnibus malis, da propitius pacem in diebus nostris, ut ope misericordiae tui ad iuti, et a peccato simus semper liberi, et ab omni perturbatione securi, expectantes beatam spem, et adventum salvatoris nostri, Iesu Christi. Christe quid existi apostolis tuis, pacem relinquo vobis, pacem meam do vobis, ne respicias peccata nostra, sed fidem ecclesiae tue, eam quae secundum voluntatem tuam, pacificare et cuadunare dignieris, qui vivis et regnas in secula seculorum. Pax Domini sit semper vobiscum. Et cum spiritu tuo.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. All generations will call me blessed, for God has looked on his lowly handmaid. For those who cannot now receive Jesus in the blessed sacrament, we offer the following prayer. I believe that you, O Jesus, are in the most holy sacrament. I love you and desire you. Come into my heart. I embrace you. O oh, never, never leave me. May the burning and most sweet power of your love, O oh Lord Jesus, I beseech you, absorb my mind, that I may die through love of your love, who were graciously pleased to die through love of my love. Amen.
Let us pray. Renewed with this heavenly food, we, un we humbly implore you, Lord, that having received your Son, born of the tender virgin, under sacramental signs, we may profess him in words and hold fast to him in deeds, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Dominus Fobiscum. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. Ite est.
Prayer for vocations. God our Father, who wills that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of your truth, we beg you to send laborers into your harvest and grant them grace to speak your word with all boldness so that your word may spread and be glorified and all nations may know you, the only God, and him whom you have sent, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Americas, Mary, Mother of the Franciscan Missionaries of the Eternal Word.